I'm actually stealing Adam's introduction here, but um, <laughs> um, I'll hand it over. All right, I'm going to try and use this thing. I'm not used to using microphones, so hopefully I don't blow out any eardrums. Uh, my name's Adam. I'm the executive director of the Marmot Recovery Foundation, and this is Kevin. Kevin is our field coordinator. I'm going to provide, like, you know, the, the 10,000 foot overview of uh, the marmots and the marmot recovery program. Then I'm going to let Kevin steal my thunder with the really fun stuff, like, you know, actually spotting marmots in the wild. But I, but I'm going to start with like the basics, like like what is a marmot, and this isn't a marmot. This is, this is a red squirrel, but marmots are related to red squirrels. Marmots are a member, they're a rodent, they're a member of the family Scuridae, which is the squirrels, ground squirrels, um, ground hogs, which are actually a marmot. In fact, there's about 15 species of marmots worldwide. I say about because there's some debate right now about hoary marmots, whether they're one species or two species. But, but all of those marmots live in the northern hemisphere. And all of them are adapted to surviving long, relatively harsh winters by hibernating for extended periods of time. So these are the things that all marmots kind of have in common. They all dig holes. They're kind of like an upside down squirrel, right? If squirrels are these hyperactive balls of anger that, you know, climb trees all the time, marmots are the opposite. They're basically slow animals that live on the ground and dig holes instead of climbing trees. But of these 15 species of marmots, the Vancouver Island marmot is unique. And it's unique in part because, of course, it's the only marmot that occurs on Vancouver Island. And it only occurs on Vancouver Island. Unfortunately, it's also the most endangered mammal species in Canada and the most endangered marmot species on the planet. So the question becomes, like, how did we end up with this situation? I mean, how did we get to the point where we've got um, roughly 300 marmots and a totally unique species on this, you know, sort of mid-sized island of ours. And our story begins, and I, I, don't worry, I, I'm not, I'm not going to spend, um, I'm going to rush through time here. But we do start about 2.1 million years ago during a period of glaciation in the early uh, Pleistocene where there were these ice bridges forming between Vancouver Island and the mainland. And at that point, this group of marmots came across and arrived on Vancouver Island. And as those ice sheets receded, that mar those group of marmots became trapped here. Now, these marmots, when they first arrived, this is the divergence point. They're not what we think of as modern Vancouver Island marmots yet. They're the common ancestor of Vancouver Island marmots and the coastal clade of hoary marmots. But they have a lot of features in common. They have a lot of features in common with each other. Both Vancouver Island marmots and hoary marmots are marmots that specialize in living in these uh, fairly uh, rugged, subalpine type conditions. So not all marmots do that. Groundhogs, you know, they live in city parks. Uh, Yellow-bellied marmots live at much lower elevations as well. But these marmots, and likely their common ancestor, really specialized in, you know, so the more extreme subalpine environments. Like all marmots, though, they would have been digging homes. And this is an important feature for marmots. Vancouver Island marmots as well, they, they need soil. So they're going to dig and they're going to use those hibernacula to escape the harsh winter months, but also things like sun and insects and predators during the summer. Those hibernacula in particular, they can be up to four meters deep underground. So these are not small structures, they're really very, very large and very, very deep. So there needs to be a significant amount of soil for these animals to be able to survive. And they would have been, uh, you know, extreme hibernators. So again, all marmots hibernate, but not all marmots hibernate for truly extended periods of time. Vancouver Island marmots and hoary marmots, they're both, you know, hibernating for six, seven months of the year. These are some of the few mammals that are actually asleep longer each year than they're actually awake for. And they would have been eating this diet of wildflowers and grasses that we associate with these uh, really lush ecosystems that are also really snow and ice driven. So, you know, feeding off of a lot of lupin, a lot of grasses, 
But now we're stuck. We've got this group of marmots. They're here on this island. And they begin to undergo uh, evolutionary changes. Some of the things that change, they acquire this uh, what we call melanistic pelage. So this characteristic brown coat, white nose, white belly. What's really weird about this, and, and I think I have a low standard for weird, maybe, I don't know. Anyways, what I think is really weird about this is you do see this exact pattern in other marmot species. When a melanistic individual is born, a, a sort of a, a dark pelage individual is born, it happens in other animals too. Um, but in marmots, when you, get a, when you get a melanistic groundhog, it looks exactly like a Vancouver Island marmot. What's exceptionally weird about this is the genes that cause this are actually different in melanistic groundhogs than they are in Vancouver Island marmots. Uh, like I said, I'm, I have a, I think it's weird. But okay, other, other things that change, their skull morphology changes, their bone structure changes. Um, they also change their social structure. So Vancouver Island marmots, they're, I mean, they're typical islanders, right? They're really tolerant of other marmots compared to other marmot species. So in particular, Vancouver Island marmots are really tolerant of young marmots. So when young marmots arrive in a colony, as long as they're about two years old or younger, the colony is usually pretty welcoming to them. So they're able to set up shop. And that's really important to their survival on this island in the long run. The other thing that changes is they develop all sorts of new vocalizations. Vancouver Island marmots have more vocalizations than any other marmot species. They have vocalizations to communicate between young and parents and parents and young, uh, to communicate about predators, about aerial predators. And this is a really distinct feature of the I our island marmot. And then over the next two million years, give or take literally, you know, 500,000 to a million years, um, you are left with a situation where these ice sheets are expanding and contracting, expanding and contracting. And Vancouver Island marmot habitat is expanding and contracting with them. During periods of, you know, glacial maximums, the marmot habitat stretched right down to sea level. And we know that because we've recovered, I say we, marmot bones, Vancouver Island marmot bones have been recovered from sea caves on Vancouver Island. But during glacial minimums, such as we're in right now, marmot habitat contracted right to the very tops of the mountains. And there's really strong evidence that during some of those maximum periods, that there, were, there was interbreeding between Vancouver Island marmots and hoary marmots. The full extent of that isn't greatly understood. Clearly, there's a lot of really distinct genetic differences with the Vancouver Island marmot, but some interbreeding definitely happened there. And what we're left with is kind of our modern Vancouver Island marmot. When exactly we would have first started seeing modern Vancouver Island marmots, I don't know, but you know, at least 20,000 years ago, maybe, maybe a lot earlier than that. We just don't know. What we do know is that you know, after the last ice age, Vancouver Island marmot habitat was restricted to this blue area on the map. Just really the spine of Vancouver Island, that kind of high elevation subalpine habitat where without that glaciation period, this is all that's left of marmot habitat. And even within that blue range, that's not a solid blue, right? There really would have been just little dots, little isolated colonies connected to each other by those young dispersers, leaving their colony and making their way to new colonies. But we're really talking about a group of basically connected villages within that blue area. We've got kind of a house cat sized animal I mean, we always say that. They always look larger than house cats to me out in the wild, but it's because they're all fur. They have this really thick fur coat to survive in those cold um, periods. But, but they typically weigh about 10 pounds up to a max of about 18 pounds. They weigh more than that in captivity, but that's another story. They're really slow breeders. So I know when we think of rodents, we often think of squirrels and rats and mice, you know, and they're just, pumping out the babies all the time, but M Vancouver Island marmots aren't doing that. Likely as an adaptation to this rather extreme environment and the really long hibernations and the toll that takes on their body, they reproduce really, really slowly. So a typical female is gonna mature at about three years old. She's only gonna have a litter once every other year. 
And those litters are only going to be two to six um, individuals strong. Now, when you consider that the average lifespan for a wild Vancouver Island marmot is about six to ten years, and at about eight years, female reproduction rates really seem to slow down, that means your typical female, if she survives her first year and makes it to adulthood, she's only likely to have two, maybe three litters in her entire life. From a recovery perspective, that really makes our lives more difficult, right? They're not, they're not pumping out babies all the time. And as I mentioned before, this dispersal, at two years old, roughly, uh, marmots are going to leave their natal colony, the, the place where they were born, and they're going to go out, strike out, and try and find a new colony. And as we'll see later, that's critical to the survival of the marmot when their habitats are really fragmented. Um, it creates what we call a rescue effect. It prevents inbreeding. And, and all of these have become issues in, in modern history. So now that we have our, our, you know, our modern marmot, finally they get to meet their first people. And this probably occurred sometime around 12,000 years ago, give or take a few thousand years. Uh, Vancouver Island marmots were uh, important animals culturally, not a primary food source for any First Nations, not a primary source of fur, but they were Qualchuk, were a sacred species for the couch and First Nations. Um, what we call Shone Lake Mount Cain area was um, Pepicata, the, the place of marmots. And the Coquacula, the Namgis First Nation, had actually built um, huts there to hunt for Vancouver Island marmots. And those were owned by specific families, and those furs were considered to be an important part of potlatch ceremonies. The Nuchalnuth peoples hunted marmots using pit traps. And this is something we see on the mainland, too, where um, uh, people like peoples like the Tagish First Nation were using pit traps to hunt for hoary marmots. I think it's worth noting that aside from the Cowichan First Nations, there are no more marmots left in any of those traditional territories. That situation persisted probably for, well, thousands of years at the very least, right? 10,000 years is a pretty reasonable guess. The first um, European settlement on Vancouver Island was in 1849. The first description for science of a Vancouver Island marmot was in 1913. A Californian ornithologist, Harry Sorth, was hired to come to Vancouver Island and conduct a survey of wildlife on the island. He collected six marmots from what's now called uh, Douglas Mountain, um, and they're still in a museum in California. But there really weren't any systematic surveys for the marmots conducted until the 1980s. Even though they were described or listed as an endangered species in 1976, the marmots themselves uh, were only listed because their, their range was so small. And it wasn't until naturalist groups and hiking groups really started to raise the alarm that marmot populations seemed to be declining, that people really spent time going out and trying to survey for the Vancouver Island marmot. So 1984 is our first real systematic survey for the marmot. And after that, I think the trend is pretty clear. Right? Where did that line start? You know, if we could recreate surveys going backwards, we don't know. We don't know what the historic population of Vancouver Island marmots were. What we do know is that by the time we started counting, it's pretty clear uh, they were on a really, really steep decline. Um, by the 1990s, early 90s to mid 90s, you know, there's a few brief spikes up. But, um, but the population was crashing. Colonies were disappearing from one year to the next. And we'll get to, th get to the low point in a couple minutes. But by the late 90s, it was really clear that the wild population was in extreme trouble. And one of the big questions is why. I mean, when we think about species decline and species collapse. You know, there's some familiar refrains that come to, to mind, right? Habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, and habitat degradation. You know, or human consumption. None of those on the surface appear to be an issue for the Vancouver Island environment. People had stopped eating them. That wasn't what caused the collapse. Marmot habitat itself, I mean, nobody's done anything in marmot <laughs> habitat, to be blunt, right? It's too harsh. We are talking about literal avalanche shoots and bowls. Um, 
The only time we really see human occupation of marmot habitat is when we build ski slopes, right? And that actually seems to benefit marmots, not harm them. So if we haven't, if we haven't, you know, messed with their habitat, you can't log, I should point out, marmot habitat, right? Because there's no trees in it. That's what makes it marmot habitat. If there's trees there, the marmots die out. Another issue we'll be coming up against shortly. So what happened then? I mean, whatever happened didn't happen in marmot habitat, it happened around marmot habitat. And you know, I'm sure that you've all heard that refrain, right? In nature, you know, you pull at a string and you find out that everything else is connected to that string. And that's certainly the case for, for the marmot. We really need to go back to that way that marmots survive, that dispersal of young marmots going from their natal colony to another wild colony. That's what allowed the Vancouver Island marmot to persist. And that's what we interrupted. So the first thing we did was high elevation logging. Now again, you cannot log a marmot habitat because marmot habitat is tree free. But when you create a cut block, you create an area that looks an awful lot like marmot habitat to a marmot with one really big problem, and that is that the trees in cut blocks are gonna regrow. And, and unfortunately for marmots, once they've set up shop there and the trees get, we call them Christmas trees, but you know, once they get to be even that high, those trees provide stocking covers for predator. And, and marmots survive by living in a colony, watching from high perches for predators and warning other marmots if they detect a predator. But with stocking cover, that advantage is taken away and the predators could get into these spots and simply wipe out a colony in a hurry. At the same time, we also created all these other barriers to dispersal, you know, particularly in Strathcona Park. And remember, that's the big lump on our map of historic marmot habitat is Strathcona Provincial Park. And we built Strathcona Dam and punched Bottle Lake right into the middle of it. Well, marmots aren't <laughs> fantastic swimmers, right? They're not an aquatic species, they're not otters. They might be able to cross, they seem to be able to cross little rivers, but they're not going to be able to swim across Bottle Lake. I mean, it looks like a nice small little lake there, but I'm sure that many of you have been to Bottle Lake. Like that's, it's a big lake. And on either side of that lake are tons of marmot colonies. You know, it's where we've been reintroducing marmots to, but historically we know that there were marmot colonies all through there. And putting that lake in there just severed all of those dispersal routes. So while we're severing dispersal routes, we're also introducing species that cause problems for marmots. And again, you know, this introduced animal, cottontail rabbits, they don't live in high alpine ecosystems, right? They live down here where we do but they still have ramifications. And in this case, the ramification of cottontail rabbits is that it provides a year-round food source for golden eagles. Golden eagles used to be, in the 1960s, they were a vagrant species on Vancouver Island. They'd show up, but there were no nesting, there are no records of nesting golden eagles here. Cottontail rabbits are introduced, suddenly we start to get more and more golden eagle nests showing up on the island. And golden eagles, they're a mammal predator. Bald eagles eat fish, they eat gulls, they eat mammals sometimes, but they're not a significant predator on marmots. Golden eagles are a whole different story. You know, in the interior, there are golden eagles that specialize in hunting hoary marmots and yellow belly marmots, I mean, that's what they do. And they can make the distance from hunting a cottontail rabbit, getting up into the mountains, and hunting marmots during the summer in the space of a couple hours, easily. And so, you know, just kind of like any other network, right? We just started stranding these little dots. Marmots and cut blocks were cut off. Natural colonies weren't receiving dispersers. And in a small area, a small colony, any small wildlife population, disaster is just a matter of time. It's always going to happen, right? Something is going to happen. Maybe it's a predator, maybe it's a flood, maybe it's a fire, maybe it's a really bad avalanche, and if none of those things happen, then it's inbreeding, right? Something's gonna happen unless there's a strong network, and we disrupted that network. So by the end of the 90s, it was really clear. 
this species was in serious trouble. And to be entirely blunt, the feeling was that it was going to go extinct in the wild, that that was probably inevitable. We were created in 1998. The first marmots were brought into captivity at the Toronto Zoo the year before. At the same time, um, we and, and the federal government and the provincial government were working on a recovery strategy. That recovery strategy really identified that captive breeding was going to be necessary to save the species. And again, to be honest, part of the thinking was that if we didn't have marmots in captivity, we'd simply lose the species. You know, that we didn't expect that the species would survive in the wild. So for over the next few years, 55 marmots were pulled out of the wild and into captivity. The marmots that were targeted were marmots that had pretty close to a 0% chance of overwinter survival. Pops were not surviving one year to the next. Isolated individuals that were on their own were not surviving one year to the next. So those individuals were targeted and brought into captivity at the Toronto Zoo. Uh, the Calgary Zoo joined a year later. And then we built the the Tony Barrett Mount Washington Marmot Recovery Center, it opened in 2001. But the marmot population didn't stop falling. At its low point in 2003, we could find 22 marmots left in the wild. Ten of those were at Mount Washington, and they showed uh, fairly extreme signs of inbreeding, a lot of hair loss, uh, overabundance of predators, uh, eye issues. And there were an additional 12 marmots between three or four colonies in the Nanaimo Lakes. Now, it's really important to note we probably missed a few marmots, right? We often say there were fewer than 30 because chances are good there were a couple of others out there that we didn't spot. But there weren't many. That same year, we reintroduced the first four Vancouver Island marmots to the wild. And it didn't go particularly <laughs> well, to be blunt. Um, the first four marmots released, three of them were eaten by a cougar within a couple of weeks. The fourth marmot we recaught, we brought back into captivity. And this is a refrain that you hear with a lot of captive breeding programs. Right now, we're hearing it with the spotted owl captive breeding program, right? They are first reintroduction was a disaster. And, and that's kind of the way it goes. There's a lot for us to learn about getting these animals to be able to have success in the wild. Fortunately for us, we were given the opportunity to keep trying, to keep doing research and try and figure out what factors were really driving success. And we were able to bring the marmot population in the Nanaimo Lakes area up really rapidly. Within 10 years, so we're going back to about 20, um, 2012, 2015, um, we had over 200 marmots in the Nanaimo Lakes area. But we didn't have any marmots in Strathcona. We did have a thriving colony at Mount Washington, but we had not tried to reintroduce marmots yet to Strathcona. So with what seemed like a really healthy population in the Nanaimo Lakes, we decided to stop releasing captive bred marmots there and turn our attention to Strathcona Provincial Park. And Strathcona was brutal. It was different than the Nanaimo Lakes. And, and I think the big difference in the Strathcona area, winters are longer, summers are shorter, Temperatures are colder, but most importantly, there were no marmots left at all and hadn't been for an unknown length of time, but at least 20 years. And so all of the structures and infrastructure that marmots create, remember those really deep, four meter deep burrows? It takes energy, a huge amount of energy for marmots to dig those. And then they reuse them year after year after year. We have hibernacula that we know have been in use since the 1990s. Um, they're still being used today. In the interior with hoary marmots, there are hibernacula that have been documented as being in continuous use for over 50 years. Marmots reuse these. They don't dig them all every year. But the marmots that we were releasing there, they had none of those advantages. They had to recreate all of this habitat that they had lost. Initially, um, I mean, it was it was pretty dismal, about 4%, one in 20 marmots that we were releasing was surviving to adulthood. And so we really tried to find ways that we could, again, we could increase their success in Strathcona Provincial Park. And one of the things we pioneered was creating a snow school at Mount Washington. So Mount Washington 
really successful colony, really high survival rates. So we would release captive bred marmots there for one year, retrap those marmots, and then translocate them when they were two years old to Strathcona Provincial Park. And their survival rates were dramatically higher, like five, six times higher. We went from 4% survival to adulthood to around 15 to 20% survival to adulthood, which is almost the same as what we'd experience with wild marmots. Which is great, except that while we were busy doing that, the Nanaimo Lakes population crashed again because it wasn't ready for it to take off on its own. And so it was clear to us that one, we needed to really sort of spread out our captive breeding releases, ensure that the Nanaimo Lakes area was getting support. But we also needed to find new ways of supporting a wild Vancouver Island marmots. One of the things we started doing, and, and initially when we started feeding marmots, um, our goal was that we would attract them to cameras so we could monitor them and pull them away from the road at Mount Washington. But one of the things we noticed was that the marmots that were accessing these feeders seemed to be having litters more often than we expected, right? They, they were, yeah, we'd get marmots that would suddenly reproduce every year instead of every other year. Or they'd have three litters in, in um, four years. Or, you know, it's just really seems, and still does seem to us, that these marmots have more reproductive success. And so we've dramatically expanded that into Strathcona into the Nanaimo Lakes area so that more marmots can benefit from that. And the other thing we started doing is restoring habitat. This is something that we'll talk about more, and for anybody who spends time in the mountains and has spent time in the mountains over the last 20 years, you know, you've probably noticed the creep, the elevational migration of trees up the slopes of mountains. As we lose snow energy in our mountains, the snow is what keeps trees from growing in marmot meadows, right? Marmot meadows aren't above the tree line, they're just below the tree line. But avalanches and snow creep literally scrape those trees off the meadows. But that doesn't happen if there isn't enough snow. So this is where we're at today. You know, back in 1984, we started off with about three, just over 300 marmots. And today, we're back to about just over 300 marmots. Now, in some ways, that's a pretty spectacular success. 22 wild individuals, I mean, that, that's as close as you can get to extinction without actually experiencing extinction. There are 48 species of birds and mammals globally that we can honestly say have been saved from extinction by conservation action since the beginning of the 90s. The marmot is the only one in Canada. Without this work, the marmot is extinct. Th there's, there's, there's no question about that. But that's not to say that our work is done yet. You know, if we closed up shop and we walked away, what would happen to the wild marmot population? It would crash again. Right? We're not, don't have a sustainable population. We don't have those dispersal networks built up yet. We don't have them out of what we call a population pit. They still experience more predation than they can sustain. Um, and that's because <laughs> predators, you know, a marmot is just a snack to a cougar or a wolf. Um, so they'll take about the same number regardless of how many marmots there are. But there aren't enough marmots yet to really sustain that level of predation. So what's next? Well, yeah, it's not, it's not going to be easy sailing just to move forward. One of the big concerns we have is their genetics. Um, marmots have experienced a profound population bottleneck and are highly related to one another. And that creates a scenario where they might have issues adapting to uh, future changes. That could be disease, it could be habitat change. And habitat change is relevant because we know that habitat is changing. This is an area called Haley Lake Ecological Reserve. This reserve was created to protect marmots in their habitat. And that top photo, 1949, 2016. And I mean, all of that area in the top, that white snow patch, that's all bare ground. And you can see on the bottom just how many trees have moved into that, those areas. 
Kevin was in this area doing habitat restoration last fall. Um, I can let him tell you as they were removing, and we're not, these aren't big trees, right? They're, there's just often tiny little things. Some of them are larger. Um, as you're removing trees, you're seeing these old hibernacula, these giant front porches for where the marmots were, areas where they used to be able to live, that have just been overtaken by forest. But despite those challenges, I really believe there's a future for the Vancouver Island marmot. I think this is a species that we can save. And I think that that's really important. You know, we really need to be able to show that we can save species like the Vancouver Island marmot. And I mentioned that, I mentioned the, you know, the spotted owl a little bit earlier. Um, mountain caribou is another one that comes up regularly. These are species that are also really at the brink of extinction. And there are lots of people, <laughs> I'm afraid to say, that are ready to write them off because it's expensive to bring these species back, right? It costs a lot of money. And a lot of times people are say, well, it's hopeless. You just, you can't do it, right? There's no, there's no point in worrying about spotted owl. It's done, we're finished, let's move on. And I have literally been in the room during some of those conversations, and the marmot gets literally brought up. You know, we, we succeeded with the marmot, right? We're making headway with the marmot. We started with 22 marmots. There are more mountain caribou than 22, even in some of those really, really depressed herds. There's more spotted owls, not in Canada, but in Canada and the United States. There's more than 22 spotted owls left. We can save those species, but we need to prove that it's possible. Unfortunately, nope, not yet. You gotta, you gotta let me talk about, you wanna talk about donation? Oh, okay. No, I, don't worry, you'll know when you're, when you're right. So, the reality is that we couldn't have saved this species without public donations. 75% of our funding comes from the public, not from government, from the public. And that is what's made it possible to save this species. So, uh, you know, the Avalanche Club, the Vancouver Island chapter of the Avalanche Club of Canada makes a donation every year. Those donations have literally saved a species from extinction, which personally, I think, is an incredible legacy. But this audience in particular, no, you're still not ready yet. You know, you know, you know, give you time. Um, this audience in particular, the other thing that we'd really ask you to do is when you're out there, be responsible. So, you know what I tell my kids? You have to leave the house. If, you, you know, if you're going to go out into the mountains, you've got to leave the house clean. You, you don't have to come back clean. You're welcome to come back as dirty as you want. I don't, I don't have anything against washing clothes. But you've got to leave the house clean. You've got to wash, it, particularly the bottoms of your boots. Make sure that you're not transporting pathogens, seeds. Um, the big one, you know, you walk around a farm or uh, somewhere and you step in some, you know, poop. And that's the way that we transport pathogens around. If you see marmots, observe them, but try not to disturb them. And they'll tell you if you're disturbing them, right? They're going to stand up on their hind limbs. They're going to whistle. Uh, if they're really disturbed, they're going to go and they're going to run for cover. At that point, back off. And this is where I actually turn it over to Kevin, because he's the marmot spotting expert. So, Kevin. Okay. I had prepared the last few slides, but that's fine. You did a, a fine oh. job. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Kevin Gorley. I work as the field coordinator for the Marmot Recovery Foundation. Uh, so I get the lovely job of uh, actually being in the mountains leading our field team. Um, so we have maybe just quick uh, kind of a background of, of the field work aspect of this project. We have uh, eight of us basically that are um, full time on all summer. Uh, marmoteering is the, our, the word that we use for it. But um, we spend a huge amount of time up in the mountains um, using a number of different surveying techniques to try and track uh, and locate and spot Vancouver Island marmots. Um, and it's not an easy task, but it is a beautiful office and uh, I certainly don't have any complaints. I'm uh, looking forward to getting started again next month. Um, but obviously, 
Uh, we're here with the, Mar with the Alpine Club of Canada and various other hiking groups. So I do want to uh, kind of talk about what you guys uh, could be looking for while you're up in the mountains and what to do when you spot something that uh, could be related to a Vancouver Island marmot. Um, maybe, show of hands, has anybody seen a Vancouver Island marmot in the wild before? Even on Mount Washington, that counts. <laughs> So it's it's not unheard of, yeah, out of Hass, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't count. Um, obviously, they're extremely rare. So most people have not seen a Vancouver Island marmot before. Um, you know, even with some very accomplished climbers in the room, they spend a lot of time up there. Um, yeah, they're they're extremely cryptic and difficult to see. Um, so I guess the first thing is be patient uh, when you're in the backcountry. It's un you're very unlikely to see a marmot. Uh, that said, if you do want to see a marmot, go to Mount Washington, because they're pretty easy to spot there. Um. <coughs> but there is ample opportunity to spend time in areas where you might see a marmot, in marmot habitat. Um, and I guess um, what, what I, the message that I want to leave with you guys while you're up in the mountains hiking is to have marmots floating around in your mind and have kind of a few key ingredients uh, of marmot habitat that you might be looking for when you're in the mountains. When you spot those key ingredients, then, um, you, know, then you can think, all right, actually, this is, this is an area where you might see a marmot. Um, so deep soil is extremely critical for um, marmot um, marmot habitat. So this is a kind of a perfect example of a giant meadow in the middle of Strathcona where you've got a lot of this really light color vegetation here. This, the light green stuff, right? That's, that's herbaceous vegetation um, that's growing in a, a bed of soil. So that's really, really important. So as soon as you're, you're hiking through the mountains and you see those lush light green meadows with herbaceous veg, that's a really good indication that, all right, this is starting to look like, you know, there's foraging available here, there's soil to, to burrow in. This is potential marmot habitat. Um, you can see up on the back of the mountain here, these cliffs that are kind of up on the top of the meadows. Another really important feature. They like to have their backs protected by cliffs. Um, I think we've got another better picture coming up here of uh, some talus. Um, but basically, escape terrain. So areas w for marmots can duck underneath the rocks and hide and get away from predators and feel protected. Um, another, that's kind of the, the third important ingredient to marmot habitat. So soil, her, um, light green herbaceous vegetation, cliffs on their back, and, uh, and escape terrain. <coughs> so here's the first test. This is what you're likely to see when you're hiking through the mountains, when you're looking for marmots. Um, not exactly what Adam was showing you, for this giant blown up picture of a marmot face staring at you, right? Uh, that's not actually what, it, what we see when we're out there. Um, but yeah, our team will, will go up into an area like this and we'll spend three days just scanning these rocks looking for little black dots, like that one right there. Um, often what you can do when you're in an area in marmot habitat um, is look at all the point features. Anywhere where there's a bump, where there's rocks, uh, like rocky outcroppings, um, or if there's, you know, if there's stumps, um, and there'll be often a little black dot just sitting on top of that rocky outcropping or something. So they are, you know, if you can kind of scan all the point features in, a, in marmot habitat, that's often a good way to, to look for um, marmots, and you can spot them from far off that way as well. Um, yeah, and I guess the last point there, um, their alert mode, um, when, a, when um, you know, marmots are, are very effective multitaskers, maybe I'll say, um, in that when they're out above ground, um, especially in the early morning and in the, in the late evening, um, they'll often be basking on rocks, right? Like full spread eagle style like this, just taking in the, taking in the world. 
Um, but they're thermoregulating, they're digesting, they're being vigilant of the world around them. Uh, they're, you know, potentially listening for other alarm calls or communications from other marmots. So they're, they're actually multitasking when they're uh, just basking on the rocks like that. Um, and um, so I guess if you do see a marmot in the mountains and you see them starting to respond to your presence there, just be aware of that and, and um, you know, don't want to put marmots down uh, underground uh, unnecessarily. An interesting cue actually though is if you are able to get very close to a marmot when they're above ground, it's uh, a reliable indicator to um, how close that marmot is to a burrow. Um, because if they know they have a uh, escape train or a little place where they can go and hide, um, say like right underneath the rock that they're sitting on, you can actually get very, very close to them before they'll react to you because they know they have a safe spot. But if you're, if you're hiking you know, through the mountains, you see a marmot way up ahead and when it, knows it notices you, it takes off running or it, it, it scurries away, um, chances are it's in a quite an exposed area where it doesn't um, have uh, you know, a, a burrow to get, to get down under. Um, so that's a useful tool that we can use when we're tracking their habitat. All right, another exercise. This one should be easy. You guys should be able to see this one. This is actually on Mount Washington. Uh, again, a focal rock outcropping, little black dot on the top of it. That's pretty characteristic type thing that we're looking for. Um, another good strategy for looking for marmots is... Um, if you actually want to observe a marmot, try and stay below them uh, because they're usually sitting on an outcrop looking down and, uh, um, and because they're expecting their back to be more or less protected by some sort of feature above them. So they're much more sensitive to activity above them. They're more, they're more likely to, to run and go underground if they, if they see something above them. So um, when we're surveying for marmots, we usually try and approach a meadow from the bottom and then sit somewhere kind of in a, in a concealed area and look up above us and look for those little heads looking over the rocks down on us. This one's a little more challenging. Anybody, anybody see a, the back in the middle? These rocks? He's actually sitting right up here on this rock. Wait, no, it doesn't work. Yeah, you can see a little, a little white nose, a little brown dot on the rock right there. <laughs> yeah. Can I? Does it work by bringing my mouse over here? Yeah, right in here. So this is actually uh, this is uh, quite a unique colony out on the west coast of Vancouver Island, where um, we're we're lucky lucky to get in there every second year because it's a very difficult place to access. Um, but um, these uh, every time we go there, we always see marmots. They seem to be doing well. Here's another one. <laughs> they don't always show up where we might expect to find them. So this was a marmot, uh, this was Chopper, right? Yeah, so Chopper, just before my time joining the foundation, he ended up in a woodshed in Arrington. Um, uh, they, don't, um, they don't always make it to uh, their intended locations when they're dispersing. But uh, if you don't, don't see him there, this marmot is hanging out right in here in the woodshed. And Chopper was trapped, and where did he end up long term? He was. Okay, there you go. <coughs> so Vancouver Island marmots um, lo have some, uh, I guess, uh, look-alikes on the island. Um, so this is one of the main culprits that you might mistake as a Vancouver Island marmot right here. Uh, well probably, what, 30, 40% of the, the marmot observations that we actually get reported to us are of uh, martens, maybe even <laughs> higher, higher percent of that. Um, but uh, I'll show you some videos to be able to tell them apart. They are um, quite different. Uh, they look quite different, and they behave very different. Their activity patterns are quite different as well. So um, as Adam said, they're kind of the size of a large house cat. 
Uh, and of course, Vancouver Island marmots are usually at the tops of mountains. Um, not, uh, not likely to be mistaken for a low, a low elevation animal. Um, yeah, let's look at a few videos here, just kind of showing the differences because a video is worth a thousand million words. And I'm a big fan of pictures and videos. So this is a prime example of marmot movement. They don't. <laughs> very much. Marmots um, are generally very, very vigilant animals. They spend a huge amount of time sitting and watching their surroundings. A typical kind of movement pattern that you would see when a marmot is making a beeline across the meadow, when they've got somewhere to be, they're on a mission, is shuffle, 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 sit and watch for 10, 15 seconds. Another little shuffle, sit and watch. Um, so if you're if you see a little mammal darting across the meadow, like bouncing all over the place like a slinky, uh, chances are it's not a marmot. It's probably uh, either an ermine or a marten or something else. Um, yeah, there he is. Yeah. So not to say that they. They don't. Um, they don't move. Sometimes um, we'll see some examples of them um, boxing, uh, which you know is some impressive movement for these chunky little guys. But um, yeah, their move. Their movement tends to be very sporadic and, uh, and not particularly linear or uh, straightforward. <coughs> Next. Here's some active marmots. So as Adam alluded to, marmots are extremely social animals. Um, they have a very strong social network. They develop very strong social bonds with other marmots in the colony. And a big part of that, especially with young marmots, is hashing out that social hierarchy via boxing. Um, is one of the behaviors that we see in Vancouver Island marmots. Um, also, their nose bumping is another really important social bonding behavior that we see, especially amongst uh, parents and, and young. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, as uh, terri territorial behaviors, if you have a young male dis dispersing marmot coming into an area, it might have a territorial dispute with uh, the established residents in that colony. Um, so that is very characteristic marmot behavior, boxing. These guys are not marmots. This is a hyperactive slinky, is what we call it. This is a uh, pine marten. You also notice that it's eating meat. That's also very not marmot behavior. Marmots eat vegetation. Um, but these guys are hyperactive. They they uh, they move around constantly, and their bodies are very elongated. Um, similar to Martin's, and I'm just going to let this video play because this is an awesome moment when the northern goshawk comes here and chases them off. And then there's, uh, there's another moment in here, which is, yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> so that is also something that you'll never see a Vancouver Island marmot do, attacking uh, a, a uh, a bird of prey. So some things to look for when you do see a Vancouver Island marmot. Uh, ear tags. Ear tags is very useful information for us to know if this is one of our known marmots that uh, we have uh, history with or if this is a wild, uh, a wild marmot. Um, so all of our captive-born marmots or wild marmots that we trap receive this little metal ear tag on the sides here. Uh, important to note that that little guy up on the left there, uh, you can really see that little fold of skin that they have in their ears. So that uh, can, can be mistaken as a little shiny flash in the ear, but that's, um, uh, that's very much not an ear tag. These are, these are the little ear tags to look for here. Um, 
the other things to be looking for are burrows and hibernacula. Um, these are definitely, um, you know, relatively easy um, features to spot when you're in marmot habitat. Uh, whether or not they're currently active, um, they're, you know, they can be, for example, ones like this that have been there for probably 20, 30 years have a massive amount of excavation on the front of them. So um, for us to know where these features are on the landscape is really, really important because uh, of the amount of effort that it takes for marmots to create that infrastructure. Um, we want to try and document where that is and put use that in our strategy for reintroductions of where we would consider leaving marmots. So we have a big database where we go around and collect um, important habitat features like these burrows and, uh, and try and document where these habitat features are on the landscape. Um, I love this picture on the, uh, on the right here because it gives you a really good uh, idea of what we call the front porch. Uh, so this is all excavated material, right? So this burrow entrance here probably goes down you know, up to four meters into the ground and you can see exactly how much material has been excavated under there and they can get quite deep like up to this this big a, a pile of uh, material under there. This time of year, you probably won't see a front porch on a hibernoculum because it's still covered in snow. But as of the next couple of weeks here, what you might see is an emergence hole. Uh, and we'll be probably leaving on our emergence surveys in, in three weeks time or so. Um, uh, where we fly up in a helicopter, we'll fly along ridge lines, and we'll look for this very, very distinctive pattern on the snow of a hole on usually with dirt coming out, spilling down the front of it, and tracks radiating off the sides. And it's such an easy, distinctive pattern to spot from the sky that last year on one flight, we actually found three new colonies in Strathcona Provincial Park just by flying down ridge lines and looking for that pattern. Um, so a really, really useful time to spot marmots. Um, on on the snow on the white background. Um, so if you are up there, you know this spring, and you see these, definitely let us know. Um, don't get too close. Of course, these are marmots are at their most sensitive time in their whole uh, annual cycle. Right? They just come out of eight months of hibernation. They're emaciated. They're very thin. They're looking to breed, and they're looking looking to put on weight again fast. Um, so it's definitely a time when we give marmots a lot of space, and we try and get the um, uh, our supplemental feeders out to them, which is another thing that you're probably seeing. I was actually really wishing that we brought one here tonight um, because, uh, yeah, because the, the feeders are um, generally get spotted quite often in Strathcona, but they're, they're big PVC pipes that are probably this tall when they're stood up straight with a, a T on the base of them. They're green. They say marmot on the front of them. Uh, last year we put out uh, almost 30 of them um, up in Strathcona and Nanaimo Lakes, and they're full of biscuits, and uh, we'll anchor them uh, next to these emergence holes here in the spring and uh, provide that supplemental feed for, uh, for marmots as they're coming out of hibernation. Um, and there's also cameras associated with those, so if you do see one, chances are you're going to get on a camera. Um, reporting marmots, to uh, your observations to us. So we have a link on our website, marmots.org, report a marmot um, form, where uh, you, can, you can submit your observations. And um, this is a huge source of very, very important information for us, particularly in finding uh, new colonies or new areas where marmots are living that we simply don't have the time to go out and investigate unless we have some sort of lead to go off of. Um, so, uh, for example, last year uh, we had a hiker report marmots on Mount Celeste to us in Strathcona Provincial Park, and we had no idea that marmots were even that in that whole area of the park. They hadn't been for a long time. Um, so that that type of information, uh, you know, has pretty significant uh, implications for the recovery strategy in terms of understanding where the marmots are, understanding the connectivity in the park for dispersing marmots. Um, so that is a huge, huge contribu contribution that our fellow backcountry users can, uh, can make for the recovery effort is uh, going out, seeing marmots and reporting them to us using that uh, report a marmot form. Um, 
in terms of what to report, just collect as much information as you possibly can. Um, pictures are extremely helpful. That way we know it is in fact a marmot that you saw and we'll go up and follow up, follow up on it. Um, so if you are able to get any pictures of them, super helpful. Um, the number of marmots, the location, um, ear tags, behavior, anything that you're able to collect and submit with your observation is extremely helpful. Uh -oh. My battery's running low, so I think this is the indication that we're coming to the end here. Um, perfect timing. <coughs> so there are very few species on the planet that we can uh, say that conservation work has actually worked. That we can say we've saved this species from going extinct. So 48 species of mammals and birds have been saved from near certain extirpation and conservation efforts in the last 20 years. And the Vancouver Island Marmot is really our flagship, our, our, uh, our, our local island uh, mascot in a lot of ways of, uh, of a su success story. During that same period, uh, we've lost two mammal species and one bird species in Canada, and another 40 birds and animals are at imminent risk of extinction. Um, so um, really the tools and, uh, and strategies that we develop on this project are really helping inform a lot of other recovery projects as well. And uh, yeah, unfortunately it's, uh, it's not always an easy industry to work in, and it's not always uh, hurrahs and cheers for um, um, easy you know easy days but uh it's incredible incredibly meaningful work and uh and i think incredibly important work and i'm uh, very honored to be a part of it um so that is all i have prepared do you want to give a conclusion yeah well, thank you all very much for coming out, and uh, thank you to the ACC for helping us put this on. And um, yeah, yeah, there was uh, one question that came in online, and if you are wanting to ask questions online, just type it in the chat. Barry, do you want to go first? No. The Vancouver Island marmot is our only bur large burrowing mammal on Vancouver Island. It's one of the reasons that it is important from a conservation perspective. I mean, just aside from being a unique species that we would otherwise lose. But, um, but Vancouver Island marmots are the only one we've got that's really turning over large amounts of soil in subalpine ecosystems. In studies from other marmot species, you know, a question that hasn't been asked is, you know, what role do Vancouver Island marmots play in our ecosystems? And the answer I always give is none. There are no Vancouver Island marmots effectively, right? We've lost them. Whatever role they played in the past, it's gone now. But the real question is what role could they play if we're successful at restoring this species? And one of the things we know from other marmot species is that in the areas where marmots are active and digging, there is more biodiversity, at least in plant diversity, within those alpine meadows than there are in the areas where there aren't marmots. So Vancouver Island marmots are it. We don't have, you know, pikas or any other animals that are digging. So, or, you know, no ground squirrels, nothing. So it's just marmots. So if you see that, yeah, take a picture. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities, including, unfortunately, that it's an old abandoned burrow. Right, so we do have those on Vancouver Island, you know, right up to sort of Schoen Lake, Mount Cain area. Um, they're not active anymore, probably collapsed and filled in, but you might still see remnants of the front porch. But definitely, if you see that, take a photo, let us know. Thank you. So, 
Would you guys release so we, we have this technique now. We call it a stepping stone technique to releasing marmots in Strathcona. Because if we take a captive red marmot and we just throw it out into the park, unfortunately, it's got more than a 90% chance of dying within the first couple of years. So what we do instead is we release them to Mount Washington, just on the right on the ski slope. And then we come back the next year and we retrap that marmot once it's had a wild hibernation, some opportunity to interact with other marmots, a chance to participate and perhaps a little bit in maintaining a burrow or a hibernacula as you know with other marmots. And then we translocate it, so we move it to Strathcona Provincial Park. So yeah, we're definitely retrapping. We're also retrapping other Vancouver Island marmots to do health checkups, put in transmitters, trapping marmots that end up getting lost. You know, Kevin was <laughs> saying that, uh, you know, it's probably not, a, if you're at low elevation, it's probably not a marmot that you saw, and that is true. Um, but there's always exceptions, right? So the most famous exception is Alan. He was a marmot that was found at the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center in 2015. I don't know. <laughs> and then literally last summer, I got a phone call from a farmer in Arrington who said, I think I've got a marmot in my backyard. Is that possible? And I didn't actually just say no. Instead, I said, well, it's unlikely. Can you send me a photo? He's like, oh, yeah, I've got a photo. Sent me a photo. There's this Vancouver Island marmot right? Like, just boom. So that was um, Camus, and he, that, that marmot had traveled 35 kilometers to end up in this backyard in, in Arrington. So those marmots, yeah, we definitely want to trap them and translocate them. So we know, for instance, that Camus is hibernating now uh, successfully in Strathcona at Castle Creek. So yeah, trapping marmots is a big part of what we do. It's a real... Um, it's a real skill. Kevin can tell you all about setting traps. It's a <laughs> peanut butter is a part of it. Yeah, <laughs> just a little bit of peanut butter, just a little bit, and marmots. Just so you know, none of this healthy peanut butter crap. No, they want hydrogenated oils and sugar. Thank you very much. Yeah. So there was there've been a couple of population dips. So there was a big population decline in 2015, 2016. And that was as we shifted to Strathcona Provincial Park. Unfortunately, that population in Nanaimo Lakes was not sustainable. And um, it was so dramatic that initially we really and there was some weirdness too to the decline. So the the marmots that disappeared were almost all un transmitter to marmots. So it was the situation where we go out with the telemetry gear and we detect most of the marmots that we were expecting, but we wouldn't see anybody else. And so we really kind of questioned ourselves, like was this a real decline or are we just like a crappy field crew who can't see anything, you know, like you need glasses. We did not have crappy Yeah. <laughs> Well, and we did not. We did not have crappy field crew. They were doing what they want. They needed to do, and there really weren't. You know, the marmots really had declined. And and the story there has to do with sort of the um, the problems with trying to set a de really defined endpoint. So we had said we need two metapopulations of marmots. Each metapopulation should have between 200 and 300 marmots. Well, we got over that 200 threshold in the Nanaimo Lakes. So we were like, okay, we're done, right? We're, we're, we've s so these marmots are doing great. Population has been climbing, but it ignored the demographics on the ground, right? So, you know, when we talk about a marmot population, we talk about numbers. Well, that's not a real functional estimate. How fast are they breeding? How many of those marmots, and this was really the big one, how many of those marmots are actually reproductive adults? Pups aren't contributing to the population. Eight years and older, those marmots aren't contributing to the population. How many of them are females? I don't, you know, s sorry guys, but you're not as important to a recovery effort, right? Only takes one male to impregnate a bunch of females. It's better to have more for diversity purposes, but the reality is we need adult females. And if you go back and look at that population in hindsight, you know, hindsight is always easy. Um, 
yeah, it, it clearly wasn't going to be sustainable. And that's the lesson now is we're not going to make that mistake again. You know, we're going to use better modeling tools before we say that we're, you know, that we're done and we're ready to move on to the next step. Uh, so right, he would ask about the decline. So yeah, that was that was the decline. Yeah, online, yes. Yeah, I just want to say if you guys can repeat the question when someone in the house, oh. so, that right. so the people online can hear it. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. First question from online is how do ski slopes benefit marmots? So marmots like to live in avalanche shoots and bowls. So you think of these areas where the trees have literally been scraped off of the mountain by snow action. And if you go up and you look at a ski run, that's basically what we're recreating there, right? We're artificially making avalanche shoots. And the advantage of a ski run over, say, a cut block is that we're maintaining it as tree-free. People are going back every few years, removing any large trees that are beginning to grow up, the large vegetation that might interrupt those skiers. That's marmot habitat. So yeah, so it's a it's a weird one. I know we don't normally think of ski slopes as being beneficial for marmots, and I was reading a bunch of um, material from the 1980s uh, that had been saved up by the Conservation Data Center, and in there there were a bunch of letters uh, to the provincial government from concerned naturalist groups when Mount Washington was expanding, saying this is really going to devastate the marmot population. And I think they were right to be concerned, but again, hindsight actually it's been incredibly beneficial for the marmots there. So yeah, ski slopes, good for marmots. You think about Mount Washington, Green Mountain, historic ski slope. Um, there's another couple that I'm forgetting. Coakley. Mount Coakley, historic ski slope. We tried to reintroduce marmots at Mount Kane precisely for that reason. Unfortunately, that didn't work. Hopefully, we'll be able to get back there sometime in the future. Any other questions from online? Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, the next one would be, what can we do to help with conservation efforts if we are not backcountry backpackers and able to take photos? So, I, I mean, I think there's a few things. One, of course, donate. You know, and again, literally that's what's managed, uh, helped us save this species. But the other one is to share these stories, right? We need people talking about this. We need people expressing that this is important. Um, you know, we, that's an incredible part of why the marmot has been relatively successful. And I do love marmots. I really, really do. But they're not the first endangered species that I worked with. You know, prior to Vancouver Island marmots, I've worked with um, blue-gray tail dropper slugs, sharp-tailed snakes, western painted turtle, little brown bats. Um, bats are pretty cute. And, and I like all of those other species, but I gotta tell you, it's hard, a lot harder, to get people to share the story of the slug <laughs> than it is the marmot. And, and I, am, I am a proponent of whatever works. I really like the, the blue-gray tail. You should really go, go home and Google this. It's an amazing slug. It spreads mycorrhizal spores. It's the only one, because we don't have flying squirrels. On, okay, I'm getting distracted. Um, the point is, I'm pointing at a, a, a blank screen. That's fine. I've got to point at something. The point is that using species like the marmots, these flagships of conservation, it's what helps us conserve other species too. So share those stories. Share that that's important to you. Tell people about it. It makes a world of difference. And, and those connections, you know, those sometimes um, are people who come to us, become members of the field crew. Um, they, you know, really join the, the conservation effort in one way or another. Yep, we got one more online. Can anything be done to increase the genetic diversity? Ye maybe. How's that? So we're actually just in the midst of launching a project to develop what's called a genetic stud book. So to actually do an analysis of the genetics of every single living Vancouver Island marmot. And that will help us determine how we can encourage pairs. Now, just like humans, right? People, marmots don't always get along the way we want them to, but, but we can try and encourage the genetics to at least preserve all of the diversity that we have. And it's possible 
because this is an island species that has likely experienced population restrictions in the past, that they were never a particularly diverse species. And this is something that we see with other island species as well, is that because they experience bottlenecks, the really deleterious gene combinations that lead to really problematic inbreeding have likely mostly been bred out of the population already. So that may be the case for the Vancouver Island Marmot. It, it is possible, and this has been done just recently with black-footed ferret, which is one of the species that we've lost in Canada. Um, in the United States, they've actually cloned a black-footed ferret from a historic uh, um, specimen and to explicitly to reintroduce those genes back into the population because their founding population is like 13 individuals is the effective size of their founding population. It's tiny. So is that possible for the Vancouver Island Marmot? Maybe. Is it necessary? I mean, this isn't wood. I hope not, but it's a developing tool that if we do need it, you know, the, the black-footed ferret will be a great um, roadmap for us to follow if we do need to uh, take that approach. Any other questions here? Is there a time of day that's better to see the marmots? Yes. That's my, that's my bread basket. Uh, yes, early mornings and late evenings. Um, it varies a little bit throughout the year, but um, basically uh, the next couple of months, the earlier you can get into Marmot Meadows, uh, the, the more likely you are to see them. Uh, their activity is very closely tied to ambient temperature during the day. So basically they get up, um, you know, maybe with the sun or just before the sun, they're active until it gets too hot and then they'll go underground. Uh, their marmots are extremely sensitive to hyperthermia, um, so they, they don't really have any way of controlling their body temperature other than uh, behavioral adaptations. So they go underground where it's cool and moist, and that's how they keep their body cool during the day. So if you're hiking around in the middle of the day in Strathcona in August, chances are you're not going to see them even if they're there. Um, so early mornings and, um, and late evenings for most of the summer, um, and, and then come September, their activity above ground um, drops significantly, basically, for the rest of the fall. Um, so the best time to see them is really May and June, when the, temp the daytime temperature is cooler. They're spending a lot more time above ground. They're, doing, they're f spending a, a huge amount of time foraging. Um, come July, the pups start coming above ground, so that, you know, there's a lot more individuals to see early July as well. Um, and uh, the pups are usually quite active and they're always like be running around uh, as a group as well so they're kind of easier to spot um, and then really August the chances of seeing them is going down because of the heat in September they're just not spending as much time above ground so yeah Yeah, this, that's a good point to bring up because I really should have talked about that earlier and that often you'll hear them before you see them. Uh, so it's a very, very distinctive uh, high pitch whistle that they make, um, which we can't even play a video of it. But there's some great recordings on YouTube, so look it up for the people on YouTube. Um, <laughs> where, um, yeah, I mean, you've probably seen the, uh, the YouTube r or Marmot Reels on Instagram. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the whistle is very distinctive. Um, and often what you'll get is um, kind of one marmot that will start whistling, and then the rest of the colony members will kind of join in on it. So you'll hear a, chor a chorus of whistles. Um, and the most common thing that sets them off is uh, an aerial predator. So if there's an eagle or something that's flying above, um, or if you're hiking into an area where they're above ground and they're active, um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear whistles and be like, what was that? I heard something. And then you, you see them scurrying away. So, uh, Nope, nope. They have a huge vocabulary. Yeah, they, they have, um, we don't I know how many different types of whistles they have, but um, they, they use whistling for, um, to communicate different types of predators um, and, and different forms of communication. The other really cool thing about uh, Vancouver Island marmots is they have a vocalization called a kia, uh, which they're the only marmot species that has something other than a whistle as well. So kiaws is a distinctive sound that usually uh, adults will make when pups are present. 
Um, and so that's a pretty good indicator that there's some pops around as well when you hear a kia. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> kia! <laughs> it more or less sounds like kia. Um, yeah, there's some great, there's some great, uh, uh, we should have got some videos for that shoot. Um, but yeah, really distinctive sound. You, you'll, if you hear it when you're in the mountains, you'll, you'll be wondering what you're listening to. It's uh, quite distinctive. I just want to add, you know, so this is my routine personally. I hike up, I hear, I'm hearing very thrush. And every time I hear a very thrush, I'm like, is that a marmot? And then I hear an actual marmot. And I'm like, holy crap, that's nothing like a very thrush. But it's a good way to start. So when you hear some, you know, you hear that very thrush, that referee whistle, um, the, uh, sorry, ethereal forest trill, as Peterson would remind us, it's not a referee whistle. If you hear that ethereal forest trail, that's not a Vancouver Island Marmot, but it's the closest thing that you're going to hear regularly to the Vancouver Island Marmot whistle. The Kia is totally different, and it will knock yours. I mean, that's been my experience. It, like, it knocks my socks off. Like, you know, like I do not realize there's a marmot there, and then I hear this noise, and it's loud. Um, yeah, so you'll notice. Any other questions? Right on. Look at that. And we got to go home early. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate it. Yes. For those of you online, that's not very helpful. But for those of you in the audience, you're welcome to come up. <laughs>